Dobby is the most well-written character in My Hero Academia. If this chapter does not prove that to you, I don't know what will. Dobby for us went from being a character that was only ever visually interesting to the most fascinating and compelling character in the entire franchise. To kick things off, we would find ourselves within a police station where the nefarious Dr. Kyuga Garaki was being detained, as he had managed to discern that the battle to decide the future of the world had begun. Presumably he is being held here as opposed to a proper prison because they have all been compromised in the wake of the new normal. However, I am slightly surprised that he is not kept in a more intimidating looking facility. But to be fair, without his lab and on such short notice, I'd imagine that he doesn't really have much use at this point in time, making his liberation in particular rather irrelevant at best. The officer overseeing him at the moment would tell him to be silent, but the doctor would continue his banter undeterred. He would speak of how the number of officers had dwindled rather significantly, making the reality of the situation as clear as day to him. And as he sat there within his dimly lit enclosure, the doctor would express that every Everything they had done was for the sake of this moment, that they had to search for oh so long for what he would describe to be small, stunted seeds. And in the present, we would see Dobby spiral up and above the statued visage of the former symbol of peace, All Might, by way of his hellish torrent of fire ascending him as he would cackle in the face of his oh so concerned little brother Shoto. I see Doctor's words will further express that what they had so drivenly searched for were the few wicked seeds worthy of being vessels. And it's from here that things get really real. But before that, drop a like and subscribe to Plot Armor for more. We would then be brought back to that ever so devastating day 11 years ago on Sekoto Peak, what was largely believed to be the death of Toya. Here the young boy was being incinerated by his own firepower. The heat was horrifically devastating and the child truly didn't want to die. The reason being that he still hasn't shown him. He still hasn't shown Endeavor what he can truly do. After all, Toya recently felt as though he had made a breakthrough in regards to his quirk prior to these tragic events. But in this fit of desperation, he would manage to rush himself into a nearby pool of water. The doctor would then speak of his master all for one himself to also be a child tossed aside for possessing a bit of darkness. Which only makes me long for the complete backstory of all for one that we can expect to see at some point before the series concludes. However, the doctor would quickly correct himself by saying that rather than darkness, it was as as if he had the entire world at his fingertips from the very beginning. What he had was everything. As we would then see All for One in a suit and hat walk through the flames to procure the body of Toya. And listen, this chapter, oddly enough for as great as it is, managed to frustrate me, but in regards to the My Hero Academia anime adaptation, on account of their cutting of content that ultimately proves to be oh so relevant as time goes on. In this case, we see a particular look for All for One that is shared by the very same mysterious man that brought Shimura Tenko home, which coincidentally, afterward, he began to itch in relation to his emergent quirk, which was suspiciously late to do so. Yet in the anime, there is no such inclusion of such a man, and there is even another detail later on that didn't make it into the anime that connects these insane events to another major villainous figure, but more on that in just a bit. Suddenly, we would have the awakening of Toya, and the visuals of the scene of him lying in bed reminds me of a particular shot of Bakugo, as well as another of Shoto, so it looks like Horikoshi is a fan of such shots to follow after major developments for his characters. I mean, Bakugo's, for instance, was him awakening in the hospital after narrowly avoiding death. Toya would sit up and begin to check his environment, as on the wall behind him would be some notes and children's crafts and origami, one of which said, get well soon, Mr. Sleepyhead. And as Toya looked around, the environment appeared to be like that of a children's daycare. Which brings us to our other bit of cut media from the anime adaptation. The details of this room in particular may be seen from a rather ominous shot of the villain Overhaul as a child when he made the revelation that quirks are a disease. Which is to say that Overhaul, prior to coming into the care of the Yakuza, was a child molded by the rhetoric of all for one, which therefore provides a whole new level of credence to his radical dogma based on the quirk singularity doomsday theory, an apocalyptic hypothesis created by none other than Dr. Garaki himself, not to mention the fact that it explains why he's so casually discerned who overall was upon his liberation from incarceration. And so do you see why the unnecessary cutting of such content is so bothersome to me? I mean, we still, after five seasons, have Toya's hair being colored red in the anime. And listen, for sure, there are way worse anime adaptations adaptations out there when it comes to screwing the series canon, but as someone who so thoroughly appreciates these small details and has created a plethora of incredibly accurate theories based on such inclusions, it is a bit disheartening. But anyways, Hoyo began to not only wonder where he was, but why he was still alive. From which point, some other children would notice that he was finally awake, as one of the girls would refer to him as Mr. Sleepyhead, as we had seen him described to be on the note behind him. Toya would then ask him what this place was, only to then be terribly shocked by the sound of his own voice, not even recognizing 
realizing it. Puberty had begun to take its course, making it clear that a whole lot of time has passed. One of the girls would let him know that this was home, and the other would rush off for an adult, from which point we would then be informed just how long Toya had been asleep. It had been three whole years. The girl speaking only just recently arrived, but was told as much by the adult they called Sensei, a revelation which flabbergasted Toya as he would wonder what happened to him, only remembering the fact that he had burned up at Sekoto Peak. But regardless, he resolved to go back to his true home. However, the happy flower-headed man would tell him that he could do no such thing, much to Toya's confusion. And after playing Undertale, I think a whole lot of us may have a shaky relationship with malicious flowers. Sensei would then say that Toya lives here now with everyone else, that all the other children would become his new family, believing that he would warm up to them quickly. But Toya would urge the man to slow down as he had to go home. He would then begin to speak of his father Endeavor, convincing himself that the hero was probably so busy that he couldn't come to see him, saying with a shaky smile that that undoubtedly, his father was probably worried sick about him. He acknowledged that he had done and said some terrible things, and so we need to apologize to his mother and his siblings, finally saying that he just wants his dad to look at him again. And this is horribly sad. Even despite being asleep for three years, he tried to find any way possible to justify his father's inability to see him, desperately craving for that attention. But to follow this shaky belief of his, a voice would emerge from a nearby computer. They would say that such a thing was not possible anymore. Toya's body burned away to almost nothing, which made putting him back together an especially arduous and extensive procedure. His partially destroyed tissue had been grafted onto him to speed up the boy's recovery. He was scarred all over his face and had gone through many changes, but at the very least, he was still alive. Toya would then hold onto his neck, questioning the notion of changes, placing emphasis on the change of his voice. And the response to this would be that he would no longer be able to use his power as he had before. He had sustained severe damage to a number of his organs, and his somatic nervous system was a wreck, therefore making bodily sensations such as pain incredibly dull. Overall, his body had become weaker. And so, going back to how he was before was an impossibility, which made Toya grab his mouth in shock. They would say how they would have wanted him to join their ranks before all this. After all, they had placed so much time and effort into his restoration, but in the end, he was a failure which absolutely scrambled the young boy's mind on account of all that he had experienced prior with his father. The voice would question if this hit a nerve, then remarking about how pitiful his life must have been, seemingly attempting to knock the boy down for the sake of building him back up again. This voice, who all things considered we may presume to be all for one, would immediately propose the prospect of being able to restore the child's firepower to what it was previously, expressing that he can become part of the family, go to classes, and have fun. But Toya had reached the point of derangement as he began to cry, and remember, he is a very emotional person whose true firepower manifested in the midst of tears wildly running from his face. Toya would tell the man behind the screen to shut up, as he had no intentions of learning from anyone besides his father. And so yeah, clearly they did not know the sort of broken mind that they were dealing with, because I would imagine that by waning him onto the prospect, or even having him come to certain conclusions on his own, would have better suited their desires. Essentially how Madara managed to coerce Obito. Garaki would lament that it was simply too late to show him the way. He was far too burned out already. That even all for one, the man who controls everything, found it impossible to manipulate the obsession Toya had for his father. He was broken beyond repair. We would then see the entirety of the building housing these seeds go up in flames as Dobby fled the scene. What one might argue was his first true act of villainy. The children were simply spares in the event that anything were to happen to Shigaraki, a contingency plan that cultivated especially strong, deformed saplings filled to the brim with hatred, all of which made them perfect vessels for the Demon King. Dobby was one such spare, but ultimately proved to be a failed creation. And this is all monumental for a number of reasons. One, incredibly enough, in an alternate timeline, Dobby could have very well become the successor of All for One and come into possession of the power. Two, there were a bunch of other children like Shigaraki lying in wait with crazy powerful quirks. I mean, for overall to be one such child should say more than enough. Although I will say that aspect sort of throws me off to be fair though. As for all these children to have been so carefully guided and possess such incredible quirks, I would hate to think that they all got bodied by a weakened Toya who hadn't even been properly trained in over half a decade. Truly, this seedling concept for me is one of the coolest things I have ever heard of from this series. And it kills me to know that yet again, 
again. This is another case of Horikoshi resigning from the path of insanity, failing to realize the ultimate potential of some of the most fascinating prospects. It is the very same issue to be found in the high-end Nomu being killed prior to the true realization of their potential. I mean, hear me out. Could you imagine how cool it would have been to have the hero school of Yue face off against a specially cultivated class of villains, all of which having the potential to become the Demon King? We could have had a whole slew of characters that parallel our various Class 1A characters in meaningful ways that only serve to further cultivate their relevance to the overall story and narrative beyond simply being Deku's classmates. We could have expanded beyond the revolving and all-encompassing conflict of All for One versus One for All, branching into even further intrigue and rich villainous origins, the equivalent of an Espada or a Katsuki from My Hero Academia. And perhaps you could argue that we already have that by way of the League of Villains, and fair enough. However, admittedly, for as fun as the League of Villains have been at times, I gotta say this sounds like a far more intriguing concept. And so for as much as I love all this, it brings me an uncanny degree of pain, but maybe that's just me. Please, I would love to hear your thoughts on the matter down below. From there though, the police officer would begin to question why the doctor was speaking, before correcting himself to instead inquire as to what exactly the doctor was trying to say. Then rather foolishly wondering if this was yet another boring story of how All for One had planned everything from the very beginning. Which I'd say for a lot of us is one of the more exciting topics to be discussed. But you know what, kudos to this guy for staying on the force despite all that is happening in the world. But yeah, the doctor would clarify that the story was simply a warning from him to them. That Dobby, whom he refers to as a thing, lives in a world world detached from even theirs, theirs being the villains, that the reason they let him go was because of his worthless body, that after waking up in such a state, he shouldn't have even lasted a month. But hold on just a minute, before we go any further, we have to acknowledge that Dr. Garaki of all people referred to Dobby as a thing. And that is very telling, eerily so, considering how affectionate he is towards the monsters known as Nomu. So yeah, Dobby was not kidding when he told Hawks that they should have been keeping an eye on him even more than some others, because he really is a monster beyond comparison. There is no containing him, at least not really. And I for one think it is really impressive that prior to the broker Jiren bringing him in, all for one and the doctor had no idea the man was alive and were genuinely shocked. They would also wonder why he came back, expecting not to find any more use for him. Yet when the doctor specifically requested Dobby aid him in his unveiling of the high-end Nomu hood, while alone, Dobby would confirm that it was the doctor who was responsible for him having remained alive. The doctor's intentions behind tasking Dobby with such a thing was for the sake of discerning his true motives. Which is to say that like all of us for nearly 200 chapters, even the doctor had to wonder what Dobby's motivations were. One look at Hood, a living corpse, and Dobby had a good idea of what they had done to him prior. He was astute enough to discern the doctor's reason for calling him in, and as such would express that the reason he had come back was because it was the best place to host a funeral. And in just one chilling look at the man, the doctor knew everything he needed to. The Dobby's body was one that had overcome death by way of remaining melded together by the flames of vengeance. But now back to the present day, Dobby would admit to his younger brother that he did in fact go back home. Despite his body being weaker than before, with nothing left to look forward to in life, he still desired to be recognized by his father. And even if just a little bit, he desires to change and wanted to see that change. Toya at the time saw the shrine dedicated to him, but more than that, saw that despite three years having passed, the very same sad story was being perpetuated by his father, albeit with Shoto as a star. He was reminded once again of the purpose he was born to fulfill, and the fact that as a defective product, his life had no meaning, his family had already moved on. Dobby would then say that when you cross certain lines, the things that once shaped you lose all meaning. He devoted himself to making his flame stronger. After all, he couldn't face his father as a weakling, that even as his body burned and decayed, he couldn't feel anything anymore. From then on, he had studied all of Endeavor's moves thanks to footage available online. Which is really impressive, I'd say in the world of My Hero Academia that may be considered to be a genius level talent. Which only makes the fact of him being discarded that much more unfortunate. Kido, the sidekick of Endeavor at this point, would let Shoto know that things were far too hot. As Shoto would then realize and declare that his brother wanted to die from the start. And his villainous brother would then say that each time their father Endeavor protected the city, every time the crowd cheered for him, his heart pounded 
pounded profusely. He was pretty much a stan, and not the strange modern equivalent that has somehow become synonymous with being a fan for some people. No, we are talking about the truly obsessive and dangerous origins of the title. Toya died and Dobby was born, which was signified by him mourning himself before his altar of remembrance. From which point, Dr. Garaki would express that heat is energy born from all things in creation, springing forth and moving. All for one, a man that aspires to live forever could never possess such a thing. The sort of heat that may only drive one towards death death, as we would then see a truly diabolical and incinerated Dobby standing atop the statue of All Might he had reduced to a practically molten clump of mush. This was something even the Demon Lord All For One gave up on. The Fatal Flames of Insanity Dobby intended to burn everything precious to his father down to the ground, therefore providing proof of his own existence. Endeavor may have failed in making a hero that would surpass all others, but boy oh boy did he make quite the villain, and Shoto refused to allow his brother to do such a thing, which although he does look pretty determined here, cannot even hold a candle to the visage of Dobby right now. Good lord. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku, thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.